right. Claire, are you there? There we go. Are you able to hear me? I can hear you perfect. Perfect. All right. You want me to share an example? Yeah. So um, you posted a real good question. I, said, I think I know what the line of the question is. But um, if you could kind of walk me through it. Walk me through whether it was a situation that had occurred or if it was just something that's weighing heavy on you. I mean, what's going on? Yeah, well, obviously, I'm just two months into this insurance thing, right, final expense. So I have been focusing just on writing the new policies. But I know that, you know, offering a policy review is something that I should be doing or should be able to be doing, like sort of my next phase. And mm -hmm. I mean, I, I saw this somewhere, I don't know if it's true or not, but that 85% of the final expense market anyway, that has their policies already, they're either in the wrong type right now for them, or they're paying too much. So let me just give you an example. So this was a policy that I wrote. She was 68. She had a term, but it was going to be expiring soon in about five years. So she was wanting to keep that and get an additional policy, whole life. So we okay. did that, 15000 Of course, that's all I focused on, right? I didn't ask anything about the term policy. Um, this situation, though, she was actually declined by three companies. She had a lot in her prescription history, like – a doctor that totally over-medicated her. And each of the companies actually had different meds they called out as the issue. Um, they weren't actually on the prescription list, but it must have been like the combination of meds. And so anyway, um, I mean, in, in hindsight, again, I was just happy we were able to get her on something. But in hindsight, I'm thinking, gosh, I really should have checked more on that term. You know, maybe it made sense for her to stop that and take what she was spending and add it more to a whole life. Although then ended up being, since she kept getting declined, we did end up going with a GI. So then it probably, we wouldn't want to do that, right? In case she does pass it in the next two years, at least the term's still there. So that was just one where I'm like, in hindsight, thinking, should I have dug a little bit deeper into that term? But I didn't, because I was like, okay, let's just write a policy. <laughs> gotcha. No, that's a valid, valid point. So um, replacements are definitely a touchy subject um to industry as as a general because of this very thing um if you do the replacement incorrectly which we never cancel a policy before a new ones issued that's number one rule of thumb never cancel a good policy before a new one's issued um and don't just go around just gunslinging replacements just because you, you actually can. But keep in mind, there's a couple different things to actually look at. Uh, for this particular case, uh, starting with that one. So she's 68. She has a five five years left on an actual term policy. So assuming it, whether it be a 10-year, 15-year, 20-year term, that part really doesn't matter. Um, insofar as that she's 68 and at age 73, whatever amount of coverage she actually has in place now, it's going to be gone. Um, gone, when I say gone, I'm talking about the same price point. Uh, she'll probably be able to still keep that term, but the price will skyrocket on her into the one year renewable terms. That's how all terms are set up. And they usually go to age 95 or age 100, uh, depending on the carrier. They're all slightly different, but either way, if she's 73, having that term still, she's going to be paying a ton of money out of pocket. And it only, the cost only goes, goes up from there every single year. So, um, I mean, I think you did the right thing. Don't don't replace that part. Um, should you have asked more questions about it? Yes, because with term products, especially, um, there's a thing called a, a conversion option. So what that is, some companies allow you if you've had a policy for such a long time, or after so many years, you can convert that term into a permanent plan. Meaning, um, this, you can convert up to the, so say if it's a $100,000 policy, you can convert up to $100,000 worth of term coverage into permanent coverage, whether it be their a universal life product that they offer, whether it be a, a whole life product, every carrier is going to be different. Um, what I found when you try to convert um, that amount of money into permanent coverage, um, it's usually going to end up being a fraction of the actual death benefit that the term started with. So, for example, about 100000 I always ballpark is about 10 to 15% of what they have now will be the same price as they're paying for a permanent style product. 
So you're looking at maybe 10 to 15 grand should be in the same ballpark if they're paying a hundred bucks a month for a hundred thousand dollar term. But depending on their age, is usually about 10 to 15 percent of will be the same price, meaning that they'll surrender their term product, um, or they'll they'll surrender a portion of their term product and pick up a smaller whole life option with that same company without any health questions being asked. So they have a guaranteed in insurability. Um, so that's that's one way of doing it. That's something that when anyone has a term policy and they're they're not healthy, that's the number one question you want you, you want to ask and call those carriers to figure out if they can convert that into some type of permanent coverage. Um, so for example, uh, did one of these what this working on this since the week before Thanksgiving. And it's still not done yet, but uh, husband and wife it was a callback actually from someone I sat with back in July of last year. Called back, um, ended up liking the options. I had to pay off some other bills. Um, come to find out after going back out there and seeing them, uh, they allowed me to basically consolidate all their insurance options, which these people were over insured. Um, they had policies everywhere for a real good reason. Wife is diagnosed with cancer to about two years prior. So she's current cancer, on oxygen, um, life expectancy, they say them in anywhere between 12 to 18 month range. She has a, they have a term policy um, that's a joint through F and G. So it's a joint husband and wife policy. It has, it was a 15 year term. It has two years left on it. And it's for like a hundred grand. So it's like a hundred grand a piece is where how they have it built. But I, either way, the wife can only get whole life guaranteed issue coverage, which she already has two of those policies and they're out of the two year wait period. So you're not going to touch those. The only thing to do is if you can salvage the term um, and get it to a permanent policy from a cost standpoint, that would allow that wife to have a bigger policy and not lose the coverage. Otherwise, once that two years is up, she was going to be out of about $100,000 worth of life insurance that she's paid a lot of money inside of. And they would be stuck with, respectfully, it was like a $10,000 Gerber, I think 10 of Foresters, um, someone wrote way back when, when she wasn't cancer, um, diagnosed with cancer. So, I mean, it was basically a, not a really good a good spot for them. And there's nothing better we can add without a two-year wait period. So the only real play for them was to get that term converted, um, which that case, that company converts to a UL product. And um, what it actually did, it it's it's a GUL setup. So it actually gave her 15 years guaranteed that the policy would remain active without uh, increased premiums, um, which if the husband wanted to pay more premiums, it can last longer. But either way, she went from a two-year expiring term and reducing her coverage down to about 50000 to have it guaranteed for the next 15 years, um, which isn't a bad, bad play. And it was a fraction of the actual cost as well. Um, so it's, that was a really good play. Just only reason we did that was because we called the carrier and found out that the term's going to expire. Um, that's one way of doing it. Um, with the, and especially if you saw the three whole life declines, I mean, that's a definitely some flags of reasons to not cancel that term, even though it's going to expire. Um, you did the right thing because in that case, Claire, all you can do is, is get her into a GI. And the key is to overlap the GI product. So keep the term. So God forbid something did happen the first 24 months, it's going to pay out. And then that by the time that 24 months is up, that whole life is already established. And in that case, once that two years is already done, I'll go back to that term because it'd be about three years left um, to see if there's any type of conversion you can do to make it whole life coverage. Um, that's um, unfortunate truth. That's the dirty work behind it, and you don't get paid for it. But it's the right thing to actually do. Um, so, I mean, I went to this couple's house. I got to go back out there and go try to finish this thing up because the husband was declined for a new product, which was contingent about the other things that we had going on. So, um, similar case, just um, moving parts. And like I said, it's I spent easily four hours um, redoing this old policy that I said, I'm not going to get paid a single dime for. Um, it's to benefit them. It's the right thing they actually do, as well as it was part of the, the grand scheme of things of getting them a better financial picture with the insurance products. And it's kind of on hold because the husband got de declined um, 
from a product we're trying to write for him. Because he has also has a long list of meds um, that terms company said they would touch, and they're saying it's too much. That's not going to touch now. So we got to figure that out. But does that answer that question slightly? Kind of a story in there as well. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So piggybacking off of that, so it's like replacing policies. Um, one, you want to make sure it's it's going to be the client's best interest, not your best interest. This is just general replacement talk. Um, meaning there's either something that's going to benefit the client in doing an actual switch, whether if they, if they are in a product that's overpriced, um, getting them out of that, if they can get day one coverage somewhere else, um, if they can get better coverage somewhere else. So sometimes you come across a lot of GI cases, right? Where people just throw them on a GI product to make it quick and easy. I'm guilty of it. I used to do that when I first started. Um, that was back when Gerber was $30 cheaper than um, every graded or modified product on, on the market. So it was an easy play. If they, are, if they had a two-year wait, just give them Gerber. It's the cheapest thing possible. Or otherwise, the next guy is going to come behind you and actually do it. So um, that's long gone that is that that is over because these prices have all leveled out they're all where they where they all should be um so for, for example if you find someone that's on a gi product that could have got graded and it's about the same price point um it might be in the client's best interest to make that make that switch if they're not out of that two-year wait waiting period or not within six months of it actually happening um reason being if they can get a graded product say there's an issue um, I don't know what's a good issue for graded. Uh, let's just say someone didn't know that you can put COPD on a day one option, right? And they wrote them a Gerber or AIG policy instead. Take, they took the easy way out because they didn't understand underwriting. <clears throat> and then they put them onto a two-year wait product and you can get them day one coverage. That would be a perfect case of, hey, you don't have to have a two-year waiting period and we can save you about 10 to 20 bucks a month in premium or get your additional two or $3,000 of coverage for the same premium you're already paying and it's a day one option. That's a decent ex example of it, but um, those things, they still definitely happen. Or even if it's on, that's a day one coverage example. If you can get the person 30% year one, 70% year two on a true graded product, then it, then it, it actually makes sense. Actually, we have a good case for that one. I um, forget what the woman had, but <clears throat> it was the case she wrote in Texas, Kevin. Um, she had something. Oh, what was it? Either way, someone I, gave I her... I can't remember. <laughs> they gave her a UHL policy, which is... Um, it was the easy way out, essentially. It was like 200 bucks a month. She has... It was the EIWL. So it was ROP plus 12% interest. And uh, we were able to get... I believe it was for, I want to say it was Parkinson's, maybe? It's either Parkinson's or uh, something with kidneys. I'm not sure. But either way, we were able to get her a prosperity plan as a true graded product. Um, they took whatever issue she had without any, without any hes he hesitation. And for the same price point, I believe we got her about $1,500 more coverage. And it was a true graded, meaning if she died in that first year, instead of having ROP and 12% interest, she got 30% of the, of the death benefit. So from a number standpoint, um, you're talking, let's say, I believe this was, we wrote 17 grand. $17,000 times 0.3, that's a $5,100 check. Opposed to if she was at 15,000, or no, it doesn't matter uh, if she had $200 a month, uh, let's say she paid for six months. That's twelve hundred dollars times uh, one point one two for the interest rate. Thirteen hundred dollars. So if she would have died that first year, and she only paid six months of premiums, she would only got thirteen hundred dollars back. Uh, we put her into a plan that was the same price. We increased her face amount by about fifteen hundred bucks. Uh, maybe two thousand dollars. So we went from a fifteen thousand dollar policy up to I think it was sixteen five or seventeen thousand, same exact premium, but now she has a true graded. Meaning, if she passed away that first year, she's getting paid out fifty one hundred dollars, 
which is that's a, a simple slam dunk case. That one, that one's easy, but that's something that we did. Like I said, it, it happens. There's people that write the wrong product, or they only write what's available to them uh, without knowing. And there's some easy cases where you can actually get your client to better s- situations. But the uh, reason we, it's very cautious to talk about replacements because, like I said, you don't want to replace policies that are perfectly good. And what I mean by that, if it's past a two-year period and you can't beat the price, because the whole, the whole thing about the two-year period, every insurance company has a contestability period, meaning they have a right to view the autopsy reports, doctor's records, basically anything that they, they want to see that first two years of having that uh, policy, they have the full rights to it. Um, to determine if they're going to pay out the death claim or not. That's, that's not the same as a guaranteed issue to your weight. That's every insurance product, day one coverage, modified, grade, it doesn't matter. They have a two-year right to see the autopsy report and so forth to ensure the client did not lie. Um, so once you get see a lot of policies that are beyond that phase, meaning if they lied up and down that a- application, they were clean-sheeted, it really doesn't matter. The insurance company has to pay out that death claim after that those those two years. So you want to tiptoe around the replacements um, unless it's in the absolute best interest of the of, of the client. Um, what that typically means is more coverage for the same price, um, same coverage for less money, or at certain health issues that are now taken with ideally a day one coverage option. Um, that's usually how the price point will be better than what they currently have. And as long as you do it the right way and you answer truthfully all the health questions, you shouldn't have to double check or um, worry in the, back, in the back of your of, of your mind, is this the right or wrong thing to actually do? Um, in that case, you can either add a small policy and with, with that being said, some people can do it, some people don't. What I mean by that, a lot of seniors prefer to have one policy coming out versus several. Because um, it just takes one of those companies to draw on the wrong day, and that client's on a fixed income client, their budget's all jacked up for the whole entire month. And there's policies lapsing left, left and right, overdraft fees, and there's not really much you can do as an agent when, when that actually happens. Because the carriers aren't going to refund those fees. Um, I mean, I had AMM do it once, but still, it was it was AMM's fault. Is what actually happened. But I mean, it's it's hard. It's a hard sell to a client when they call you saying if they had several different policies and one was thrown off and it threw off their whole entire cycle because uh, they're that close to their actual budget, and they tell you they owe seventy bucks in overdraft fees. It's not much you're going to be able to do for that for that client. I can see maybe helping them out with one one of those fees possibly, but um, you're getting multiple of those. That client's going to end up canceling and getting their money back, and we lost a client um, by having them by them having multiple policies. Um, so a lot of seniors would prefer one centralized policy for everything. Um, that's where a lot of cases um, where I would do it if it's a client that has a product I can beat. Um, say a final expense option uh, for further burial coverage, and I'm doing a payment protection plan, I typically roll those all into one policy. If I'm able to beat the price, it's a better situation, and the client's either getting some type of money back or a reduced paid up option, which we'll kind of talk about that here uh, shortly. But um, I will put that all into one nice size, nice basket of Oxford or AMAM or Foresters or LBL. It doesn't really matter the carrier. They have one new policy that's taking care of both of those items, and it's one payment. Because keep in mind, too, the, as as many policies as you have, that's also the same number of policy fees the client's paying as well. So the client has four, five, six different insurance products, um, whether it be life insurance, whether it be um, whole life term, natural causes, uh, or accidental only, excuse me. There's some type of policy fee built into those, to those costs. If you have several different policies, um, you're talking upwards of three to five hundred dollars worth of policy fees a year alone. With that extra three to five hundred dollars a year, in most cases, you can add that to your your annual premium and come out with several thousand dollars of more of more coverage, whether it be term, UL, accident, whole life. It, it doesn't matter. It's it's you're paying a ton of policy fees. That's another angle to look at when what I talk about uh, giving. 
because honestly, each policy, if you get them to review the policies with you, they're going to show each of those policy fees. So for example, I think Forrester has an $80 fee that they uh, use. AMAM is 60 or 80, 80, 80 bucks annually for their, for their policy fee. Um, those add up over time if you start looking at them having four, five, six, seven different policies. Um, even if they're the small little, little tiny ones, uh, those colonial life ones, those still add up. It could be 40, 50, 60 bucks. I mean, that's a lot of money if you look at it from a yearly basis of what they're paying in policy fees. So that's another reason why I try to consolidate them, if at all possible. Not always. I mean, there's been cases where people had five, six-year-old Lincoln Heritage policies. I just had a guy that, that had one. I didn't touch it. There's nothing I, I'm able to do, um, given his, his health, for one, given how long he's had it, the premium on it. I mean, there's nothing you're, you're able to do. It's He's paying $10,000 worth, worth, worth of coverage, and his premium was 35 bucks a month, and he's 72 now. And everything premium wise for ten thousand is sixty five, seventy bucks a month. Even though he's, it's a Lincoln Heritage. Probably he could have beat it four, five, six years ago. I'm just, I'm gonna leave that one, leave, leave that one uh, be. I'm not gonna try to get the reduced paid up. Not gonna try to get a little bit of cash value inside of it. Just leave that one be and just focus on getting the additional coverage set. So, um, make sure I'm on the right train of thought. So yeah, so just be very, very careful now. Um, in doing that, said, as long as the clients tell the truth on the a application, there shouldn't be any su surprises or you having to second guess this is the right thing for the actual uh, client. Is this going to pay out for them? Um, only time you got to second guess that stuff if, 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 if you're trying to do some shady business, which don't recommend doing. Otherwise, that's, that's, that's grounds for immediate termination. But as long as you're answering the questions truthfully, just you shouldn't have any issues to worry about from a from that st standpoint. Um, but with that being said, let me share my screen. All right. I'm going to switch on this. All right, before we jump on to this next segment, have any questions from anybody about that or want some clarity? Mm -hmm. oh, you're welcome, Claire. All right, so if you haven't seen this sheet, this is the Benefits Evaluation Worksheet, or as we call it, the Ricky Ballard T-Graph. So this is, um, I mean, probably the best tools for FE agents to use in terms of keeping clear-cut information that is useful. Uh, we take down a lot of information with clients, many of it not being helpful or, or useful. But this allows you to have uh, your client's name, birthday, age, sex, tobacco status, and spouse's info, and their address um, right at your fingertips. Uh, this, this plan is also set up to allow you to talk about Medicare. Um, the way the question is worded, who do you currently have for your Medicare supplement? Um, you're openly allowed to talk about supplements. Um, per CMS guidelines, it's when you ask about Medicare Advantage, that's where things get, get, get tricky. But as we all know, most seniors don't understand the difference between both of them. They, don't, they just know it's a Part C option. Um, so you ask about a Medicare supplement, they're going to probably end up telling you they don't have a supplement, they have an actual Advantage plan, um, which, like I said, it seems weird, but this is totally CMS compliant to ask this very question here to inquire if they have other options for Medicare that you might be able to serve them with. Uh, going down, this will have, uh, you can ask the question, do they currently pay for your medications? If so, what med medications do you currently take? So this is referring to a Part D plan. Um, which is they're, they're going to be paying for their actual meds, whether it be um, St. Lone Part D, uh, a Medicare Advantage Part D plan. Um, it's it's going to just basically get them to start talking about their actual drugs. Reason being, conversation points go a lot easier starting with Medicare as your lead in. Um, as a senior benefits advisor, or, um, or excuse me, senior benefits uh, specialist, 
I can't say the word advisor, um, senior benefits um, specialist, sorry. So this leading with the Medicare piece, see if you can help them there. If you don't do Medicare, just let them know whatever plan they currently have is the best available for them. And then we can pivot towards why we're actually there, whether they filled out a telemarketed lead, answer the phone call, the Facebook lead, a direct mail. We can start digging into the whole life insurance piece of it. But like I said, we're not going to kind of go into any of these other questions. The main thing we're looking at is this little box right here. Price, face amount, cash value, reduced paid up. So the kind of the next segment of how can you get someone to benefit from actual replacement, re which a lot of the big numbers you are seeing that get posted, not all, but a big chunk of them. Um, a lot of agents are selling products, but it's not also necessarily people that don't have insurance, period. It's usually updating clients out of bad policies into better policies, um, doing it the right, the right way. And the way you do it is, one, you want to know the price. How much are they paying monthly? Um, so for this example, let's let's call it hundred dollars a month. Let's say their face amounts fifteen thousand. Cash value two thousand. This is four. So it's so I'll have my pen. But so like I said, you want to figure out the premium. So ideally, you should know um, what they're already paying for um, when they told you, hey, I already have life insurance or I have file expense. Um, I'm paying $100 a month for it. Okay, great. How much coverage is that policy worth? And you, they try to figure out if it's 5000 10 15 if there's actual death on it. Um, more times than none, I always ask the client to go grab their, grab, grab their policies. Um, and when you ask them, it's not a, please, can you go find it's Mr. Jones, you want to go grab that policy for me and put your head down and just keep working on this actual sheet. Um, don't look up at them because if you look up, it's going to make it really awkward and they're going to tell you it's packed away inside of the boxes that they don't know where, where the policy is. 90% of the time, they have a pretty good clue of where their policy really is. They just don't want to go get it for you. So if you ask it in the right in the right manner, not um, hey, do you mind grabbing that for me, or um, do you mind if I, I I I take a look? Give them a direct instruction. Hey, Mr. Jones, can you grab that policy for me? And then just carry on with doing your actual paperwork. Um, what's going to happen? They're going to look at you to look at at them for a answer, and you're not going to do it. So this going to make it really awkward. And the, really the only choice for them to have is to either get up and go grab the policy or get up and go act like they're looking for the policy and then come back and say they don't actually have it. Um, believe it or not, it actually works. Because um, like I said, most seniors, they, they know where their, where their stuff is. They have a good filing cabinet or it's a good junk pile on their uh, bedroom uh, dresser with all the important stuff. Um, or the kids might um have it i mean it's just it's once you hear one excuse and you ask the right question the right way the right tone you'll start getting through some of those issues but more times than none um they know where they're they know where where their policy is um you just got to give them the right command step to actually do it because honestly it's it's truly important that we have have it just to honestly tell them what's what's really going on with their actual product um how many times I've, I've guessed at people's policies until I called in and I realized it was something totally different the way the client ex ex explained it. They ended up telling me it was a whole term policy worth $25,000. In reality, it was a whole life policy worth 5,000 or it was accidental death worth 50,000 or it was an increasing term product that went up every five years from ARP. I mean, without calling the carrier or getting the physical policy, I frankly don't believe a word the client actually tells me. Um, not, not because they don't know any better. It's, uh, it's just, they're usually confused. They don't know what to actually tell you or they're merging a bunch that they might've had previously and it's not current. So if they can't find the policy, next step is calling the actual insurance company. Um, what you do, you put your phone on speakerphone. Um, you want them to hear from the horse's mouth 
And you're going to ask these very same questions um, once they give authorization to speak with you. So I let them know um, when they call in, ask for the customer service or the policy services team. And they're going to ask, who, who, who are you? Well, I'm a licensed insurance agent um, of Mrs. Jones. That's all you really have to say. I'm helping her call in to figure out what's going on with her policy, what type of coverage she actually has. So in this step, it's a couple of different things. One, we're going to gather some, some recon about the actual policy. Uh, second thing is we're going to, if she doesn't actually have, have a copy of the policy, um, at the end of the call, once we get all of our nuggets and kind of can see if it's worthwhile to, to mess with it or leave it there, you can ask for a brand new policy to be mailed, mailed out. Um, so a summary of benefits page can be mailed out. It's a lot of different options you're, you're able to do. Um, if they want to change the, the beneficiary, you can help them do, do that too. I mean, there's so many different things you're able to do on there. Um, but the basics, once they authorize you to be able to ask questions and gather in, information, um, because they're gonna have to ask the client some hands full of questions from the last for their social address, birthday, phone number, address all the verifying stuff to make sure it's actually them. Then you get the phone thrown, thrown back to you. So the first question, which isn't on here, always grab the policy number. Um, just in case you are going to replace a policy or you need to request other, other documents for it or the client just doesn't actually know what their policy number is, out of courtesy, grab a, grab a, grab a policy number. It's going to be helpful to us later if we if we need it, and it'll just be helpful for the client to actually have it uh, regardless. It's probably the one thing that's missing from this little chart. Once you have the policy number, you confirm the price. And when I confirm the price, I always con confirm the draft date. It comes out as well. So if it's $100 a month, and if the client thinks it's a certain day, that like the, the third, and, and I'll ask the, the person on the actual phone, that's that's a hundred dollars a month set to come out on the third of each month, right? Those you say yes, that's correct, or no, her draft day is the first. Those tell me something different. Okay, that's fine. Uh, next, face amount. Face amount. You want to know the actual death death benefit, whether it be for the natural cause amount, whether it be accidental death portion. Uh, you want to figure out the natural causes and if there's any accidental death in there um, to help offset that number. So a lot of different groups. Um, I think the one that got the most heat for it was Banker's Life Agents. I've caught it once where a client thought she had a $15,000 policy. It was really a $7,500 policy. The agent sold it as $15,000 because he had an ex accidental death rider. So in, in his mind, he told her $15,000 of total coverage. Um, the client's mind, she heard $15,000 of coverage. That's all. It doesn't matter what kind it was. She had $15,000. She thinks it's for natural causes. Um, only way we found that out was by calling the actual carrier. So a lot of companies will not not say they do it on, on purpose, but a lot of clients will mishear or misunderstand something that could have been explained to them properly, and it's not the true case. So always getting it from the horse's mouth is always best so the client can hear it, and you're not the one delivering the terrible news of what they thought was fifteen or twenty thousand dollars is really seventy five hundred or ten grand only. Um, if she died of a heart attack or stroke, right? So um, always get face amount and or any type of rider um, value on there. Cash value. So this is the current amount of cash inside the policy. If they said, screw it, I'm done with, with this insurance company, that's the amount of money they'll write them a check for minus any loans. So um, a lot of times they might have a higher cash value, and it could be windled to nothing if there's some outstanding loan balances or uh, withdrawals on that. So always ask that question, what's the true cash value um, minus surrender charges um, or uh, loan loan fees, whatever the case of it actually is, just to make it the most, what amount would they get a check for? Uh, most companies are really good about telling you the right number too. Um, they usually are, they can see it on their system. So they usually tell you the right, the right thing. So, and last but not least, reduce paid up. That's the amount of money. If you told that insurance company, keep that $2,000, um, they'll issue a policy worth $4,000 that doesn't require any more additional premiums. So that's a lot of jargon, a lot of stuff. Why are you talking about these, these numbers, right? Well, these numbers matter. Um, one, it gives us the foundation of what the client actually has. 
And two, this is the setup for if you're trying to help a person that's in an overpriced product, these are some key ideas or numbers to actually focus on. And we're talking about the cash value and the reduced paid up. So why those matter? Um, so for example, there's several groups. Um, don't like to name names, but a handful of groups you see a ton of policies from, Lincoln Heritage, Senior Life, um, Colonial Pen, Colonial Life. I mean, any of those guaranteed issued companies, I mean, that's always something to, to take a quick little peek at, as well as um, American Income Life Policies, or a AIL. Um, I said, not picking out on those companies, not picking on those agents, just the way those products are structured, they're not the most advantageous for the client almost ever. I mean, um, they're very, very, very expensive products. Unless the client got them ages prior, um, there's usually something you're able to do for that client in helping them. Um, but these, these numbers matter. So the $2,000. Um, so say, for example, this is a, a Lincoln Heritage plan. And that same 100 bucks a month, say this client was, let's call him age, he was 50. He was trying to get things done, done right. Um, he first bought the policy when he was 50, uh, 100 bucks a month, $15,000 policy. And he's held on to it for several years. Um, based off of something that happened, he was on one of the higher levels of Lincoln Heritage. Let's say they're on their modified plan, which you have to be very sick to actually get that get that option um, in their eyes. But um, in other eyes that we have carrier-wise, for example, like COPD, they're going to take that as day one coverage elsewhere. So he's got a modified plan, paying 100 bucks a month, 15 grand. Let's say he held on it for three years. Um, so he sent in a postcard from us and we're able to go out there and set the appointment and talk to him. And by asking the right questions, we find out he has existing burial coverage. Okay, great. Um, Mr. Jones, you wanna go ahead and grab that policy for me um, while I crush these numbers? And we put our head down, he, 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 he does it. And here's what we find out. He's paying hundred bucks a month, $15,000 face amount. Uh, since it's in the third year, um, let's just ex actually push that. Let's say it's the fifth year. You'll have a little more cash value. So he has, he's age 55 now. His fifth year in is about $2,000 worth of cash. And they're offering a reduced paid up option if he keeps that policy there um, or keeps the cash there worth $4,000. What we're looking at, okay, he's 55. We know he has COPD, um, inhaler only, no uh, nebulizers, no, no oxygen. No other major health issues other than some blood pressure pills. So we know with that, you can get day one coverage, um, standard rates with Liberty Bankers, Foresters, Transamerica, Assurance. Um, all those places will take them day one coverage. Out of those, we come to find out, even though he's 55, well, Mr. Jones, you have a couple of different options. We can write you a policy worth $18,000 now and your premium will be the same 100 bucks a month. Or we can write you a new policy, five years older for 55 or 15,000, and your policy is gonna be $85 a month. So we think those are the only two options. That's not the case. So either way we slice this, this one, you have those two options, either 18,000 for 100 bucks, 15,000 for 85 bucks, and in both of those options, you can either take the cash value and get $2,000 back into your bank account on either one of those plans. Or, so depending on their situation, they might take the cash, which is perfectly normal. Or we tell them to keep that cash. They don't really need the, the $2,000. They're more concerned about getting the most bang for their buck, right? They don't get the most possible coverage for insurance for the least amount of money possible um, to where they're comfortable, right? So you have a couple of different options. So if the client tells me, hey, 100 bucks makes sense premium wise, I've been paying for the last five years, that totally makes sense for me. Okay, well, we'll keep the $100 a month payment, which means we have $18,000 of uh, insurance coverage, three more thousand than what we started with. Um, and then 
you have two different options with that cash. Take the two thousand if you need it, or you can leave it there and take the four thousand dollar paid up policy. If he says we don't we don't need that that two thousand, like, like I said, I want the most insurance coverage. We're going to take that reduced paid up option. So what that means for that same hundred bucks a month at eighteen thousand dollars of coverage plus the four thousand dollars of paid up coverage. Mr. Jones now has $22,000 of coverage for 100 bucks a month. We literally increase his coverage on this hypothetical, which sometimes they do work out this so well. Not, not always, but sometimes they actually do. We, we went up $7,000 worth of insurance coverage for the same premium that he's already paying. By using this pricing on a new plan, we got better value of $18,000 coverage plus... If you took the reduced paid up, that's four thousand, which means twenty two thousand total coverage the client has for a hundred bucks a month. So that's just the, the example if the client doesn't take 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 the cash. But it can go either which way. Either we're coming out ahead by getting three thousand dollars of coverage, by getting him an updated plan with better pricing, even though he's five years older. Um and he goes from to save hundred bucks, it's not going to be except uh, eighteen thousand dollars of coverage, opposed to the fifteen. And if he walks away with two thousand dollars of cash inside of his pockets, or he's going to get it reduced, paid up of four thousand dollars of additional paid up life life insurance that we can add to our bucket of the ultimate bucket and end up with twenty two thousand dollars of total coverage. So that's a long winded explanation, but this is the exact reason why you want to call the carriers. That's why you want to get policies. Because you're able to see this information to tell us how is this policy going to actually look, um, especially if there are, we can we do this underwriting stuff first. We're going to know ahead of time whether you're using this right here, understanding the, how the underwriting guides work. If you're using Best Plan Pro, especially to see where they're going to actually get approved at. If you do that underwriting stuff first, and then you can find out their options if they are better, this stuff becomes a cakewalk. Because you already know what they qualify for in a ballpark price point. Um, but this is this stuff matters before we even get to showing them their actual pricing. So it's because we can leverage this type of option to our actual ad ad advantage um, to leave them, once again, better than what, what, what we found them. If we're able to give them more coverage, more benefits, a better product, either they're older and they're paying the same premium. That's goes. That's a huge, huge thing for a, a seniors to where this is how you see those bigger cases people are writing. Where people are writing, uh, I mean, shoot, I just did one of these with the uh, Advantage Plus instead. I mean, he had an old, um, he's a term policy from who was he? Who was his term from? Globe. Who's a Globe Life? It's another company. Globe. Globe Life. Um, True Stage. All the different companies that sell those term or five year renewable term products. He has a five year renewable term. Um, it actually changed, changed in three years. He has a $15,000 term plan, paying 81 bucks a month. The guy was 74. Um, instead of him doing that, I got him an Advantage Plus plan, which it took care of his, it turned his $15,000 term into 15,000 of whole life, as well as we gave him an additional 10,000 to give him twenty five thousand dollars of coverage for one hundred twenty bucks more than what he was paying on his term at eighty one dollars. That term was going to go up to one hundred twenty two dollars uh, once he turned uh, seventy six. So it only made sense to add a little bit more money now to have permanent coverage because now the wife not only does she have fifteen grand permanently to bury her husband, but now she also has another ten thousand, which took care of I want to say it was about nine to twelve months worth of house payments. Um, for them in the event that he would pass away and we're buying time for his income to get transferred over because he had a bigger social security check um which that'll probably be something we talk about the upcoming weeks of a payment protection plan what to look for i've had a lot of good ones this past week and it's very vivid to see why it makes sense to cover one person versus the other but in terms of replacements the ethics behind it um any questions on this stuff how to look at a reduced paid up option cash value. Mm -hmm. 
No one. No one has questions on this? I did a perfect job? Well, I had a question about the reduced pay to, I don't understand right. quite how that works. Like, how do you get access to that 4,000? Yeah, so reduced paid up. So on most whole life products, there's going to be three different lines. They're going to have the age of the actual client. Um, I would show Anna in one second. Let me do it, though. They don't have it on theirs. Uh, do I have a policy? Let me think. Let me think. I'll probably have to find one off the camera and see if I can get, get, get a copy of one. I think I might have one. But uh, inside, inside the policy packet, there will be the, the, the years. It's like 1 through 20, client's age, and they'll have their annual premium. It'll show their face amount. So um, if it's a day one coverage policy, it'll have this $15,000 on the first year. There won't be any zeros. If it's a, a graded, modified, anything else other than day one coverage, the first number will either be a really small number or a zero. And the second number will be a small number and or a zero. And then the third year, you see the 15,000. That's how you can see if it's a graded or modified. The next column over is gonna show their cash value. So the cash value is if they cancel that policy right now, um, this is a estimated number. Um, it, all, it all depends on what part inside the year they actually do it for it to be the full $2,000. So if they did it halfway through the third year, it won't be a full 2000 if 2000 was showing as the fourth year's cash value. But it's it's basically telling the insurance company to keep the cash value. We don't want it. And the third and last or the probably the fourth, fifth, sixth, whatever the last column is on the, the right hand side should be a reduced paid up column. So it's basically a figure that the insurance company calculates. Um, here, actually, I have an idea. I know a company that does do it. Um, we'll go to so I'm going to use this as an example real quick for you. So you're seeing the screen. I'm pulling up Casey Life just because on their ROP product they have the best illustration setup, and it makes this make a whole heck of a lot more sense. So this is how almost every insurance policy that has cash value should actually look. So here's this cash value thing that we're talking about right here, right? So in this case, how I sell my return of premium products, which can be done on whole life as well. I tell the client, you have two different options. You can either take the cash, which in for this policy, it's 11,715, or you can take the paid up insurance option, which is 26,750 bucks. So it's either you take the cash or you tell the insurance company to keep the cash and they give you a whole life policy worth that number right there. So reduced paid up works the same exact way on, on whole life products. Except it's just smaller numbers, typically speaking, where it looks somewhere on the lines of this up here. Um, probably closer to like this one. Here's $1,000 of cash and it's usually three to four times that cash value is what they'll be offering in reduced paid up coverage. Because things you gotta, you gotta think about it. They can either take the smaller sum now, being money, which it makes sense for that per person to do it just because that thousand dollars is just a thousand bucks. But the insurance company is betting that that client's not gonna die for a while and they're willing to give them a higher death benefit. So if they pass away two, five, 10, 15 years later, they're saying, well, we rather keep your thousand dollars because we can use that money now and we can invest it to make more money. And we're willing to offer you a paid up life policy worth this much. Because they're banking the fact that they pay out that, that death claim. If anything, it'll be a down the road. It's not gonna be an instantly tomorrow item. Um, but they're gonna make money while holding on to their cash. That's how the insurance companies, they make money. They invest uh, premiums into different stocks, bonds, mortgages, all the different stuff. And they make interest off of it inside the market. And that's how they use to pay out dividends to policies, pay pay out death death claims. It's that's how the insurance companies work. So they're will they're leveraging by giving you a paid up option that you're gonna die later and they're willing to offer you a higher number so they're able to keep on to that cash. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. So um yeah, that makes sense. And they don't have to pay 
premium is in anymore. So perfect. Correct. Clients, clients free of premiums. They have a policy that's paid up. So if you do it the right way, and they, if it's only worked for people that have policies more than three to five years, typically speaking. Um, it has to be a over overly expensive policy. Otherwise, you'll see a lot of policies. You try to do this, and they're only going to have two or three hundred dollars worth of cash value. You're only going to have a thousand bucks, two thousand bucks worth of paid up life insurance. You can still do it. It's just the 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 sting feature. Um, as 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 um, I would call it, the thing that sways them to actually want to do it instantly. It's has to be the right the right product. They have to be overpaying for it, and it was typically something that they were put into a graded or modified plan. When as a broker with all the different products we have, there's a day one coverage option for them because day one coverage is always going to be cheaper than a graded or a modified product. The more risks you have with that insurance company, the higher the cost is premium wise. So. So there's only certain cases where you'll get some really nice ones, like the like the one example, which I've actually done something similar to that, where they got a three or four thousand dollar paid up policy over a thousand or fifteen hundred bucks of cash, and they end up coming out light years ahead of where they where they started with the right the same price. Because in this case too, you want to give them the option. Because the way I look at the going back to the eighteen thousand for hundred bucks or fifteen thousand for eight eighty five. Um, Either way, we're, getting, we're leaving the client in a, in a better situation. We're either we're giving him a fifteen dollar, um, yeah, fifteen dollar month savings for the same price or, or same coverage amount, or we're giving him a three thousand dollar increase in coverage. Either way, we're doing something better for the for the client to give them the same. They're not losing coverage. Um, where things are are no are no bueno if if you're leaving the client a thousand dollars short of coverage or they're paying fifty dollars more more a month to have one company versus just adding on a separate policy. You don't want to start doing those those items. Certain things you want to leave just leave on B. Just write the smaller policy in those in those cases. If um, if you're only going to save the client uh, like one or two dollars, and they've they've had that policy for three to five years, seven, eight, eight, nine years, don't go ahead and replace that replace that policy. That thing's going to pay out no matter what for to save them a dollar. Um, there's nothing you really can, can do with that with that option. Because um, anything else you quote is going to be significantly less, or you have to d- dip into that reduced paid up bucket heavily for it to even make sense to get the climate ahead of where they get started. So it's always a j- judgment call. If you ever second guess it, call someone, um, send them a PM, text text me if you're um, inside of a house, call me, whatever the case of it actually is, reach out to someone and ask them their actual opinion. And don't make a brass choice or get or get commission breath because you see a potential of a really huge sale, but don't jeopardize your in- integrity um, by doing the wrong thing for that for that client. Because last thing you want is their health to be totally different. It's a, a contestable claim, and that claim is not now not getting paid due to something on the application that wasn't told, not by your fault, but by the client's fault. And now that family is stuck without getting 15 or 20 grand of a policy that was enforced for nine something years, right? So don't be that that person. But um, like I said, those other companies where they're uber expensive and you can run them the same exact option based on what they told you and it saves them money and it gives them more more coverage, I would say those are the ethical right ones to actually do as long as it's in the best interest of the actual client. So keeping the client's interest first over your own pocket that's that's gonna be the game changer for you so um claire thank you for this valid valid question um those getting into final 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 expense definitely recommend getting onto the ifg university page digging into some more of these videos and different content um going to the actual pitch the actual presentation um which we might do a video talking about that itself but um this is a really good concept. Um, the same concept can be, can work on term products also, um, or the ROP cases, ULs. I mean, there's a lot of different ways it's the same as that concept works, but it's the basic understandings of how uh, insurance premiums, cash value, reduced paid up options, that all plays a difference in what clients actually have. So keeping that stuff in mind goes a long, long way. But um, until then, you guys, have a great week. If there's any other questions on this, don't hesitate to reach out to me. But uh, until then, we'll catch you guys, and we'll talk to you guys soon. Take care.